I'm James Barty in Washington. Today is Friday, May 5th, and here are some of the stories we are covering. The United States expands sanctions on those impeding Sudan's democratic transition. The re-establishment of a sanctions regime against Sudan, I think, is an important statement just by itself about how far Sudan has fallen. We'll get an eyewitness account of the latest fighting in Khartoum. The governor of DRC's Lualaba province will discuss investment opportunities and women in government. Kenya and Japan seek to boost trade and diplomatic cooperation. Kenya is going to facilitate investment of Japanese companies and also support Japan to be able to finance Kenya's infrastructure and other developments. And we'll hear from some Ugandans about tomorrow's coronation of Great Britain's King Charles III and Queen Camilla. Those stories plus something O'Malley's poems are coming up on Daybreak Africa. U.S. President Joe Biden issued an executive order on Thursday expanding emergency aid for Sudan and imposing sanctions on persons destabilizing the Northeast African nation, undermining the goal of a democratic transition. Viewers Nabil Biagio spoke with Cameron Hudson, senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, to understand the significance of the move and its impact on the warring parties of the Sudan Armed Forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces. The re-establishment of a sanctions regime against Sudan um, after so much effort over the last five years has been put on removing sanctions on Sudan, whether it was the comprehensive U.S. sanctions or the state sponsor of terrorism sanctions. The move back to a sanctions regime, I think, is an important statement just by itself about how far Sudan has fallen since the removal of President Bashir. Um, it is an acknowledgement of the reality, which is the war on the ground and a very comprehensive effort by parties to the conflict to undermine any future transition. So I think it's a, first and foremost a very sad statement of policy. Um, but practically speaking, the sanction, uh, it creates a law uh, that allows the president to designate people for sanctioning under that law but the sanction does not name any individual or entity uh, to be sanctioned. So right now, there are still no, uh, no new U.S. sanctions on individuals or corporations in Sudan. It's, this is really just, I think, a, a warning of potential policy to come. Yes, uh, I noticed the lack of names, uh, much to the frustration of the reader. Uh, no names, no people have been named or entities even in the executive order. What do, you, what do you think is behind that? Well, it's clearly a tactic that the Biden administration is using, and it's not the first time they've used it. Uh, people should recall that two years ago, we wrote a very similar executive order for the war in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, creating a sanctions regime to punish those people who were committing war crimes and atrocities and who were undermining uh, a peace process there. We, people should also recall that no one was added to the list of sanctions. No one, even though more than 300,000 people died in that conflict, uh, we never employed that sanctions regime that we put in place. And so I think that um, you know, Sudanese uh, officials might look at this um, and and not be terribly uh, moved or concerned, given the recent history of the Biden administration, to threaten the use of sanctions and then to not follow through. So basically, you're saying uh, this move is not enough to change the behavior of the warring parties in Sudan or restrain them? Well, it's a warning. It's a warning, and it's clearly, uh, you know, the, the, the administration has left itself plenty of room to ratchet up the pressure. Um, but I don't think that this sanctions regime by itself is actually uh, any significant pressure on the parties. I think if people had been uh, identified, if entities, if money had been stopped, if anything practical had been imposed on either of the parties, I think that might cause them to, uh, to rethink uh, their current approach. But this right now, um, it really doesn't in my view. That was Cameron Hudson, Senior Associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He was speaking with my colleague, Nabil Biagio, here in Washington, D.C.
Sudan's rival military forces have accused each other of violating a fresh ceasefire as the conflict continues for a third week. The parties have kept fighting through a series of truces over the past week. An eyewitness says residents of Khartoum were woken up by loud explosions and heavy gunfire on Thursday. Walid Adam tells viewers John Tanza that the city is witnessing street battles between Sudan armed forces and fighters of the paramilitary rapid support forces. Bomb runs has been going on since the break of dawn. It hasn't stopped yet until this morning. There, you can still hear the sound of uh, fire jets buzzing all around. Uh, Anti-air artillery is also being heard all day. And of course, the sound of small arms like Kalashnikov is being heard also all day long. It's quite messy over here. It's quite loud. Yeah. Talk to me about these four people who were mm-hmm. killed. Which neighborhood are you talking about? I'm talking about uh, Buri. Unfortunately, it's the adjacent neighborhood to the army's headquarters and the airport. It's uh, geographically to the eastern side of it. Uh, I think it's a 105 or 120 millimeter shell fell over there. Uh, unfortunately, it killed a, a young child and uh, her father is severely wounded. Two daughters are uh, had hit by shrapnels, and uh, unfortunately, yesterday, uh, two brothers lost their life also with uh, an artillery shell. Since the start of this uh, fighting in Khartoum on the 15th of April, did you get any chance to go to the city and see for yourself what is happening there? No. In, in the outskirts of Khartoum or the suburbs of Khartoum, like the southern side, the, the neighborhood of Al-Kalakla, and uh, also the far uh, eastern side of Khartoum, uh, the Al-Hajj Yusuf, life is going as normal. Uh, shops are, high, are are opened and uh, people are going by through, the, uh, through their day. As much as you go, go closer to the center of Khartoum, as much as you're going to feel the intense of battle itself. Unfortunately, my neighborhood is like uh, two and a half, like if you want to put it in miles, like one and a half mile, one and a half to two miles away from the army's headquarters where the intense fighting is happening. You can feel the heat. Other than Khartoum, I've been hearing that school is uh, opened in Medani. It's uh, 100, like 100 and 110 miles to the south of Khartoum. Life is there is normal. It's just here because the two factions that are fighting are trying to take control of critical institutes or, and places like uh, the TV uh, station, the Republican Palace, the Army's headquarters. Those are the places that have the most intense fighting and the most intense bomb runs. I've been following this uh, fighting on Facebook mm-hmm. and other social media. If you listen to what the mm-hmm. RSF guys are telling you, you'll think they're in control of mm-hmm. Khartoum. And if you listen to the uh, officers from the Sudan Armed Forces, you will also think otherwise. Who is in control, really? The areas in the center of Khartoum, let's say, uh, my, uh, the place that I live in is eastern side of Khartoum. Uh, regarding the who controls Eastern Khartoum all day long, I've been seeing the RSF. There's, uh, I cannot see the Sudanese armed forces here, so they don't control this place. That's something for sure. Uh, the problem with social media that everyone will tell you his side of the story. So even for me here, living in Khartoum, it's really difficult for me to make sense of what's going on in a broader area. But for Eastern side of Khartoum, it's a stronghold for the RSF all day, all night. That was Wali Adam, an eyewitness in the Sudanese capital Khartoum, speaking with viewers John Tanza. Kenya and Japan have agreed to strengthen bilateral cooperation in areas that advance blue economy, infrastructure development, trade, and investment. Kenya's President William Bruto and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida met at State House, Nairobi, on Wednesday this week, where President Bruto promised to address taxation issues regarding foreign Japanese projects in Kenya. Marine Ojiambo has more. Kenya's President William Ruto termed the visit by Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida as significant. His trip coincided with the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries. Ruto says he's positive that the discussion will make considerable progress on a broad range of subjects of mutual interest between Japan and Kenya. He says Japan's support will be crucial to the implementation of Africa's Union Agenda 2063, which is the continent's blueprint for sustainable development, political and social renewal. Kenya is going to facilitate investment of Japanese companies and also support Japan to be able to finance Kenya's infrastructure and other developments, including the PPP arrangement around our construction of dams for purposes of harvesting and storage of water, 
for our irrigation. Japan has invested heavily in Kenya's geothermal power development through technology transfers, capacity building and financial support. Ruto says Kenyans will have a chance to work and become competitive in the Japanese market. In our deliberations, we agreed to align also the curricula of our two countries so that more Kenyans can access skill and quality jobs in Japan. We have also agreed on a number of bilateral issues between Kenya and Japan on the exploitation of the geothermal resources in our country. We've also agreed on a couple of other issues on the development, especially economic zone in Mombasa. On the other hand, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said that Japan desires to strengthen trade relations with Kenya to help contribute to stability in East Africa. Kishida said he looks forward to discussing issues affecting the continent later this month when he will be hosting the G7 Hiroshima summit. Kenya is the hub of a major economic area in East Africa and is a major power in Africa, contributing proactively to the peace and stability of the region and beyond in the international forum. I was given this opportunity to hear the voice of Africa directly as the presidency of the G7, I shall endeavor to reflect our discussion in the deliberations at the G7 Hiroshima summit this month. Experts say with the frequent bilateral visits to Kenya, Western and other international partners may be looking at Kenya as a best substitute for South Africa, which is considered pro-Russia. Economist Ali Khan Sachu says Japan may be looking to replace South Africa with Kenya, which in turn would benefit from financial support from the West. The Japanese have, uh, have always been a long-term partner of Kenya. Um, but also have been seeking to dilute the influence of South Africa, who have been considered uh, very much pro-Russia. And uh, you will have noticed that under the auspices of the G7, South Africa was disinvited. And I think uh, Japan is looking to replace South Africa um, as, as the definitive African voice the two leaders also noted that Africa is extremely affected by climate change and its effects. Reporting for viewers Daybreak Africa, I am Moreno Jambo in Sacramento, California. You're listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Butt in Washington. Today is Friday, May 5th. For more Africa news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And still to come on our program, Samson O'Malley Sports. The governor of Lualaba province in southwestern Democratic Republic of Congo, home to one of the largest deposits of cobalt and other minerals, says her region is open to partnership for responsible and sustainable development. Madam Fifi Masuka, Seni, one of the handful of female governors in the DRC, says while the country's rich natural resources are being a source of great wealth for some, they have also left most of the people of the region in poverty. But, she says, President Felix Chisekedi is ready to fight for a win-win partnership. Governor Masuka Seni, who was in the United States last week, sat down with me to discuss a wide range of issues, including women participation in government, the fight against corruption, and investment opportunities in Lualaba province and the DRC as a whole. I came here... Yes, there is some evidence, but also I would like to just go with what our president, Felix Anton Chisekedi Chilombo, said in Indaba. He said, are the UN chair on what we have, what we are offering, and who want to come because this time would like to have a joint venture, a partnership with it will be win-win on both sides and to show the other figure of yes there is war in congo in the eastern part but the rest of the congo we can do business there when you talk about investment 
investment and peace they go together yes. and so when you hear about the DRC and you hear all this violence going on in the east what would you tell the, a potential investor to encourage them to come to your country yes that's why I'm here because we are talking about copper we are talking about cobalt we are talking about the other material which we use in our iPhone in all the phones what we use in electrical cable and so on. All of those things, I think 60% of the world's coming from Congo. When we are giving copper, there is no security problem, but they are buying from Congo. But we need people to understand that Congo, there is a place where you can invest. There is problem. We are trying to resolve that problem in the East, but the rest of the Congo, you can come for mine, for agriculture, for energy. There is place to work and there is peaceful. I was going through your recent speech and I saw a quote that said, from resource curse to resource blessing. What does that mean? Um, Congo was blessed by God, giving us all the material that the world needs. But the same material, the people who, are, who have got bad intention, instead of coming and doing right business, they just want to take our blessing. Instead of come and fight us, please, we would like to have peaceful business, peaceful partnership. Like the president is saying, we need a win-win partnership. You know, I'm sitting in front of uh, a female governor from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I don't hear that all the time. So uh, I just want to ask you, do you have ambition to one day want to be president of the DRC or even vice president? I think for now, what I'm trying to do is to have the president, Felix Antoine Chisekedi, who pointed me to be a governor of the province of Lualaba. Who wants the province or the DRC to change the figure, to go from negative to the positive? That's why I'm here. For now, I'm very comfortable. I want to show to the women, to the girl, that a woman can do. And being a governor of Lualaba, it's a blessing because God touched the heart of the president. I was been in politics for very long, having a lot of women in the government and having also the governor women, it was not given to us. Madam Governor, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you so much. Fifi Mansuka Seni is the female governor of Lualaba province in the Democratic Republic of Congo. She spoke with me during her recent visit to Washington, D.C. Tomorrow, Saturday, is the coronation of King Charles III and Queen Camilla of the United Kingdom. Reporter Mugumi Davis Rakariji asked some Ugandans about their expectations of the event and Britain Uganda relations. I'm Lisa by names. When we talk about coronation, it's something very important because it is uh, wherever the world, all nations have those people who represent them. For example, for us from Bali, the Masaba, we have Umukuka. For him, his duty there, he plays a big role because most of the activities before conducted, for example, circumcision, we get order from him. Yeah, we expect a lot. Of course, people will be happy when they are coordinating their leader. My name is Asha. I'm glad that I'm going to witness something big because other people have died without witnessing what happens at the coal nation. So it's a big opportunity to see what takes place. And I will tell because you don't know how long it's going to be on the throne. Because just imagine the late queen has been there on the throne for how many years? I am Makrina. First of all, I expect it to be a big day for both him and the country. Then I believe more of, uh, I don't know, stability, where he is as he's reigning. Well, the good things we learn from them, civilization. Yeah, we have seen technology growing day by day. The syllabus we're using right now, it's theirs. So a lot of things, you know. 
My name is Mugmer Arpat. I think the function is going to attract leaders from all over the world. What we can learn from them, as we are colonized by Britain, is their democracy and their way of leadership as one of the best around the globe. What I know about British, it was one of the biggest countries, that is, it was one of the superpower. It managed to colonize one countries, included Uganda. First of all, the good things we learned from them, okay, the syllabus we are having in Uganda, it was introduced by them in our nation. Not only Uganda, but also other colonies eh, like Nigeria and uh, other countries. To the other hand, some of the bad things which they brought in our countries, more especially the African countries, they took most of our things, such as the resources, you understand, gold, minerals, even some of our cultures were destructed by their cultures and their attention. The views of some Ugandans about Saturday's coronation in London of King Charles and Queen is turned on for Daybreak Africa Sports. And here is Samson O'Malley in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Friday morning to you, Samson. Good Friday morning to you too, James. We begin the sports with the latest news from the CAF Under-17 Africa Cup of Nations. There are only one fixture on Thursday when Mali played Cameroon. Mohamed Barry scored with four minutes left and Mamoudou Duumbia's scorcher in stoppage time secured Mali's passage into the quarterfinals of the CAF Under-17 Africa Cup of Nations with a 2-0 win over Cameroon in Anaba on Thursday. The victory, Mali's second consecutive in the group, takes them to six points and assures them of top sport while defending champions Cameroon are now faced with a must-win duel against Burkina Faso in their final group game to have a chance of progression. With South Sudan eliminated before the start of the competition, the group is left with three teams. Friday's game will see Congo play host Algeria, while Somalia will play Senegal. Staying with age great competition, the draws for the CAF Under-23 Africa Cup of Nations Morocco 2023 will be conducted on Friday the 5th of May. The draw will be conducted at the Mohamed the Sikh Technical Center in Rabat, Morocco. Eight teams will participate in the tournament scheduled to begin from the 24th of June to the 8th of July 2023 in Morocco. The CAF Under-23 Africa Cup of Nations Morocco 2023 will be used as a qualifier for the summer Olympic Games Paris 2024 and will feature host Morocco, Egypt, Niger, Guinea, Congo, Ghana, Mali and Gabon. Staying with football news, FIFA legend and World Health Organization's Goodwill Ambassador for Sports and Health, Didier Drogba, has spoken about football's power to teach people from different backgrounds how to live together, the growth of women's football and the need to create more opportunities for players in Africa. The former Cote d'Ivoire and Chelsea forward was appearing alongside His Royal Highness Princess Raim bint Abdullah bin Musad Ali Saud of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia at the Making Trade Score for Women event, which was held at the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Football is not only about winning and lo- or, or losing. Football is about being a good person, you know, learning how to live together in a in a in a team full of different nationalities. In basketball news, Philadelphia 76ers center and league scoring champion Jewel Embiidi earned his first National Basketball Association Most Valuable Player trophy earlier this week, topping two-time winner Nikola Jokic of the Denver Nuggets. The 29-year-old from Yaoundé, Cameroon, averaged 33.1 points to win his second straight scoring title, and that